Um, my name is Jane Combs, and I'm with uh, IT at UC Research and Development. Um, uh, my department, along with Amy um, Latessa and the libraries, uh, Amy Koshoffer, were awarded a funding for this series. Um, I'm going to have to read it because the Data and Computational Science series uh, was uh, is presented by UC Libraries, UCIT Research and Development, and is supported with funding from the UC's Office of the Provost Universal Provider Award for Faculty Development. So that's how we are able to bring in speakers, such as our guest Rob Cis Cisneros. Yes. Cisneros. Um, and uh, the other initiative that goes along with this is a uh, Center for Advanced Research Computing pilot that's being developed by the Office of Research and research faculty across campus, um, which will be the back end to some of this compute that's going, he's going to talk about the visualization. So it's some of the tools that can be used um, in the back end. That should be announced in early April. And Larry Sharpman, who's over there, Larry, yep. He's our HPC systems Quiet. admin. <laughs> and so uh, if you have any questions about HPC systems, uh, he'd be happy to uh, answer them for you. So let me introduce. Robert? He doesn't look happy with it. No, he's not happy with it. That's okay. <laughs> Robert is a senior research scientist at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. A lot of times you hear that just as NCSA, I think. So. Yes. Um, and he leads the NCSA's Data Analysis and Visualization Group. Uh, this group is tasked with supporting science teams utilizing NSF HPC resources, which that's another thing that my team does is we help research get, researchers get access to the National Science Foundation, large scale, um, and the department, really the Department of Energy's high performance computing uh, resources, and the Ohio Supercomputer Center, so you can talk to me if you need access to any of those. But his group then does the piece of it that's over the top of it. Uh, they're, they're tasked with furthering the state of scientific visualization through cutting edge research. Robert's research interests and I.O. and visualization are aligned with issues of particular importance to high performance computing. These include in situ visualization, data models and representations, parallel analysis algorithms, I.O. parameter optimization, and big data analytics, of course, because big data is the word. Robert earned the degree of Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and Computer Science from Austin P. State University, degrees of Master of Science and Doctor of Philosophy in Computer Science from the University of Texas in Knoxville. Tennessee. Did I put Texas on? No, I Good. said Texas. I'm sorry. I've, I've spent a lot of time in Texas this year. Anyway, Tennessee. Everybody knew that. So, so I, was, I was worried for a second. <laughs> Maybe there is in Knoxville. Anyway, so Rob can uh, he'll he'll share all his information he knows, and we'll we'll hold. You'll have questions. If people have questions, they can ask. I'm assuming during. Okay. During yes, the, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so this is kind of a nice, small, intimate space, so please get all your answers or your questions answered. Yeah, uh, so when, when she said I'm going to share everything I know, uh, I, I try to get it all on the slides, so when I, whenever I put together something general, I get excited, so I have um, around 100 slides. Um, so yes, please stop me, and, and if you have any questions, I'm, ha I'm happy to talk about those things. Um, wrong button. So I, I put this together um, from the context of sort of best practices of an HPC center for, for visualization groups. Um, and so I'll touch on um, both the, the hardware that, that we're using in NCSA, uh, the software that, that my group supports on, on uh, that hardware, and then some of the uh, some typical efforts that we do with, with teams running at scale some of the research we've done in the past year or two, and then uh, give some examples of, of the outreach and training efforts. So this sort of rounds out the, the uh, five or six things that, that we care about when it comes to setting up a um, scientific visualization group for a supercomputing center. So uh, as, as a background, this is just uh, the, uh, uh, an image of what I think of when I think of scientific visualization. So um, we, we care about uh, the life cycle of data. So um, we have data on disk somewhere, we do some series of operations that span sort of statistics or graphics, and then we try to end up with creating pictures for, for outreach or for just understanding data. 
And um, this, this sort of overlap is, is what I consider uh, scientific visualization to be. So you can see that we worry some about the data side, we worry some about the pretty picture side, but at least in terms of the things that I care about, they're mostly these sort of these uh, data analysis operations that you do on data. Uh, for HPC biz, I like to reference this paper. This was one that was published maybe, uh, oh, there you go, in 2011. And so this is Visualization of Supercomputing Centers, the tale of little big iron and three skinny guys. Um, and so it turns out that um, this uh, group of authors here were invited to NCSA uh, as sort of an advisory panel for what to do for a scientific visualization um, by my old boss at NCSA. Uh, to, to give a report to NSF for what, what it is that we need to do for visualization. And so um, the um, big iron in this case is your supercomputer. The, um, and our supercomputer in CSA is the Blue Water System, which you can see has um, almost 27,000 nodes. Um, and we have an aggregate memory of 1.5 petabytes. So the one thing that's kind of special about Blue Waters um, it, it was, I think, still is the largest query, even though it's, it's five years old, so we have 288 cabinets. Um, the machine that was faster on, say, the top 500 list was 200 cabinets, but they had uh, exclusively GPU nodes, whereas the vast majority of ours are non-GPU nodes, and those have twice the memory. So we also have roughly twice the memory of that machine as well. Um, my favorite definition of big data was from the director of NCSA. He said that for us, big data is anything that can't fit in main memory, so anything more than 1.5 petabytes, <laughs> which I thought was an excellent definition. Um, okay, and then so we have these other things uh, that come from that paper, and this is Little Iron, this is sort of your visualization cluster, um, and then the skinny guys, which are the staff experts. And so. They got into a little bit of trouble, the authors of this list, for um, saying that you know, these groups are skinny guys. Um, what it turns out that what happened was uh, my old boss was that skinny guy. So uh, the guy who was my boss at Oak Ridge when this paper was written uh, had told uh, NSF that uh, you, you, you don't have enough uh, resources for scientific visualization. All you have is just one skinny guy. And so that was my second boss. Um, funny thing, when he, when he wrote out and said that he was hiring, he said, I'm looking for another skinny guy, and I, I thought he was a fat bigot, and I was a little worried. <laughs> okay, so um, one of the first things that you have to do from this perspective is ensure that you have an appropriate little iron. Um, and so you, we typically either have a completely separate analysis cluster or one machine that does everything. And uh, the, the main consideration here, I, I put cost with capability and convenience. I mean, obviously it's more expensive to have additional hardware for visualization. And so for the separate cluster, um, again, this is still the, the most common usage scenario. So if you, if you go to um, Argonne or, or Oak Ridge, they have uh, two, uh, multiple separate uh, pieces of hardware for analysis and visualization. If you're lucky, they're connected by the same uh, file system. Um, and this is the, the way things look. You know, you run your simulation on the supercomputer, you dump it out to a file system, and then later, from that file system, or you're copying over the file system to this cluster and doing your analysis and visualization. Um, of course, this has a problem now, um, and in, in particular, uh, uh, over the last five or six years, where you, we're generating data that's so, uh, so large that it's, it's difficult to get a big enough VIS cluster. Um, and if you're not sharing a file system, it's difficult or, or sometimes uh, impossible to move it from the original resources generated on. Okay, so um, the other two use cases, and this is how we're dealing with the known blue waters, is your simulation is hitting the file system, um, and then you're doing analysis as a separate routine, or uh, we, we're dealing with in-situ analysis, so we're bypassing the file system altogether. The simulation is running, and it's either passing the data through the analysis routines before it hits the file system, or the analysis is actually sharing resources with the simulation, again, bypassing the file system. Uh, so, of course, um, I mean, look, the, the real answer of why we did it this way, maybe we couldn't afford a separate <laughs> resource, but uh, there are a lot of benefits to doing it, right? And we, we don't have to deal with um, moving data 
Um, and I think most importantly is that we're guaranteed the appropriate resource to do all of our analysis and visualization. So for some tasks, say for flow visualization, that's a computationally expensive uh, uh, piece of, of visualization or analysis that you do on that type of data. And so you, you need a serious resource for that. And what we found is that really it's not all that inconvenient. So even though we're competing with um, these jobs that are running that on maybe maybe 100,000 cores or something, um, and, and we want to do smaller work than that usually, we have a separate debug queue that, that we can run interactively and, uh, in 30 minute increments and then all the tools that we worry about in this scenario have ways of, of doing your actual rendering in batch so that you know you can sort of you can play with data still um, and then for your your final software your running in batch. Um, so I tossed this in here because um, we've had uh, some issues with uh, people wanting to use graphics cards for graphics, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, there's there's a uh, a real message on the visit developers list that you can find that uh, someone says, hey, I want to use the GPUs, can you do this? And the response <coughs> from one of the developers from Lawrence Livermore was literally, why would you ever want to do that? So I mean, these giant tools are written for spatial domain decomposition. Um, and so you have this issue, of course, before you can use a GPU, you have to copy everything over to a GPU. And if you have you know, communication intensive algorithms, it's very difficult to do that copy and bring things back and communicate. So this is getting better. Um, there are um, uh, new uh, connection fabrics for GPUs, for instance, from NVIDIA, where at, at least up to maybe 8 or 16 GPUs, you can do this uh, very well. But beyond that, you're still getting to issues of scale. Yes? If you already said this, I apologize, but what's BMD stand for? BMD is um, Visualization and Molecular Dynamics. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a separate code that uh, is developed out of um, uh, the building next to mine at CSA, um, but yeah, I didn't say that. So uh, that's a case where uh, the visualization is being done of NAMD data. So this is another um, molecular dynamics code, the simulation code. And so for molecular dynamics, they're typically dumping out geometry. You know, you see balls and sticks. Um, and so the geometry heavy data is is still ideal for GPU. So this is sort of our our one use case of of um, uh, simulations that are generating geometry that need to do visualization. And so basically, we are supporting uh, nice DCV, which is um, similar to BNC, so uh, uh, a ser client server setting for looking at X windows of our supercomputers. We're basically supporting these tools only for the one, um, the one team that, that runs standby and BMD. Okay, so um, so I, I don't really consider those um, at scale visualization suites. It's just sort of something I tossed in there. Um, of course, uh, to support large scale science, we have to support large scale visualization tools. Um, we have giant data, and so um, that's obviously why we need these things. There are tools that are built specifically in mind for data decomposed um, spatially, um, and of course, you know the the reason that we do that is to be able to generate um, imagery from, from giant data. So this, um, typically when you're seeing people using HPC resources for creating visualizations, they're doing, they're parallelizing temporally. So every node is creating a single, um, say, image of a time step. This uh, visualization was created, this single frame on a thousand cores on blue waters. Um, so this is a, a downdraft of, of a climate simulation code and, and again, uh, big enough, uh, just the single time step to use that, that kind of resources for, for um, generating the, the image. Of course, it, it gets worse than that, right? I mean, we always assume that the areas of interest are trivially visualizable, right? And that's, we're getting to the point where now that's not even the case. So this is an example of a, um, an AMR data set, so this is a, an adapted mesh refinement, so that this, um, this, can you see that? I can't. Yeah. You can't or can't? I can't. Oh, I can't, so I don't know what I'm pointing at. <laughs> From this angle, I can't see it. So this red bit is the, um, the least refined grid, and so when interesting physics is happening, 
um, they, they get refined further. And so then you have this green refinement, the blue and the black. And so it turns out that the only thing that the, any, anyone cares about in this, this giant data set um, is just that little black nugget there. And so this was actual data generated on Blue Waters when we stood up 44 cabinets as an early science period. Um, and you can visualize that little nugget and it looks like this. Um, but the issue is here that this little black box I've highlighted on that visualization, there's enough data in that area to create an HD resolution visualization. And so um, this guy, if you uh, print this image out at 200 dpi, it's, it's, it's seven feet tall, right? So not a lot of us are using seven foot monitors yet. And so um, just, just uh, implicitly we're, we're uh, destroying parts of our data resolution. So yes, this is that little black spot. Um, so we have tons of data now. Okay, so um, the typical uh, tools that, that we support are as in pair view, um, and of course there are a few others that are uh, specific to workloads. For instance, YT is an astrophysics tool. Uh, we were supporting that before NCSA hired the guy who wrote it, um, and so now we, we at least mention it a lot so that we can force work off on him if, if, it, if people actually need it. Um, so here's, here's a little bit about YT. This was originally developed for the um, Enzo code. Um, so as, as running um, in situ or, or looking at astrophysics data, but it's, it's uh, Python based. And so right now it's still command line, but it, it's getting more and more general and, and becoming easier to use. The interesting thing about this is that the, um, the routines that are developed in parallel are written using API for Python. So if you install YT and then you just enable MPI, MPI for Python things that can run in parallel automatically well. Um, and as for visiting pair view, um, I, I always like to Venn diagram these guys. They're both scalable to um, well beyond 100,000 cores. Um, they have uh, client server mode so that things are, are easy to look at interactively. They have batch mode and situ support. Uh, tons of data operators and data support for file formats. Um, we're talking hundreds in, in this case, and um, honestly, there's, there's nothing worth putting outside of the intersection here. So they're very similar tools, both based on the same data structures. Even. Um, so even though we support both, I grew up uh, in the, the half of DOE that used Visit, and so that's the tool that I'm an expert at, and the uh, examples I give will be from Visit. So, the visualizations I've showed so far, the, uh, the climate one on the thousand cores, the, the astrophysics thing that looked like a fireball, I did both of those in VISIT. Okay, so VISIT has uh, the kind of tools that you would expect for um, looking at, at uh, scientific visualization data. We do um, sort of this, uh, this pseudo color rendering. This is sort of the bread and butter of looking at data. It is a um, just taking a scalar value and, and applying a color map directly to it. And so in this case, even though you're looking at 3D data, you're only looking at sort of the outside. So this is a topologically 2D, 3D visualization, whereas the volume rendering is both 3D and topologically 3D, it's the only one. Um, there are some info -vis tools like parallel coordinates. There are some tools for molecular visualization I wouldn't necessarily recommend. Uh, using visitor pair view for molecular vis, there are better tools. Um, and Streamlines is, is sort of a specialized case of, of looking at, at uh, vector field, flow field data. Um, but it, it's, it's one of the most challenging algorithms to implement, to do well, and uh, it's one of the most widely used as well. All right, and so I mentioned that we, we care some about creating images, we care some about, uh, and we care a lot about uh, the operations that you do on, on data sets before you generate those images. And so when you install Visit, um, each one of these is one of the, um, what they call operators in Visit. This is one of the things you can do with your data set before you visualize it. And by default, these are the ones that are turned on when you install Visit. There are several others that you have to go in and explicitly ask for that, that are more complicated, like the line triangul uh, triangul triangulization. <laughs> um, but you can see that you have some typical things here, right? So for um, geometry, if you have, say, a climate data set and you want to apply a height um, to, to some variable that you have on that data set, you can do, um, uh, where is it, um, <coughs> extrude. Um, there's also a separate 
um, elevate operator no, that will let you do that. Uh, there are uh, uh, ISO surfaces, thresholds, uh, the, the typical kinds of things that you would, you would expect to do with, with uh, data in this context. And so I'll highlight just a few, and, and um, in some cases there are special considerations for doing these at, in HPC. And so, for instance, this is an ISO surface, so this is a typical one. So if you have this big data set, you'll say, okay, I, I really care about where pressure is around the value of 40, and you're sort of going through and creating a surface along that value. It turns out when you do this in parallel, uh, you, you get cracks in your ISO surfaces. And so it's just simple things like making sure that the algorithm even gets you correct results in parallel can become a, a real nightmare. So this is um, this efficient parallel extraction of crack for acid surfaces is the title of a paper that was published by uh, Visit developers years ago for solving this problem. So uh, as soon as you move to HPC, you'll find that you're solving a lot of problems that, that you thought were solved a long, long time ago. Um, one of the great things that you can do in Visit is something called mesh comparisons. Um, so there are, this is a, a, a window from a wizard for comparing the meshes, even though you can do this by hand by typing Python commands. But you can do things like um, load two different data sets and say, okay, I want you to evaluate um, all the values from this data set onto the mesh of the second data set. So once you do that, you can do things like um, take two time steps of the same simulation or or two pressure measurements from two separate runs, put them on the same mesh, and then just subtract them if you want. You can look at differences. You can do all kinds of things once values are on the same mesh. Um, <coughs> there are time expressions in visit. And so you can um, look at, um, so you can pick, say, one location in your data set. Um, and you can say, OK, show me if I have 1,000 time steps in this data set. Show me what the, the maximum um, uh, value of, say, pressure is at this point across the entire lifetime of the data set. And so then you can start seeing things like um, how this thing changes uh, over time. So now you can see that we're um, I'm looking at things both spatially and over time. So you can make selections across lines, single points, and then look at these over time. Um, there's a data bidding operator. So this is um, something else that, that uh, we end up using a lot, even though it, it didn't really exist in visit uh, a few years ago. So um, you can think of a uh, histogram is, is a sort of 1D bidding of data. Um, this allows you to do things like uh, 2 and 3D uh, sets of, of bidding operations. So um, you, know, you can create a 2D histogram, for instance, or um, a scatter plot. Uh, a scatter plot similar to a 2D histogram, except you see a lot of overplotting typically in scatter plots. And so this is a way of bidding, make sure you don't have overplotting. So you can specify both the dimensions that you're going to use to bin, the number of bins, and then you can decide how to color it based on something else. And so this has been abstracted so that at every bin, um, you can pick your reduction operator. So uh, again, uh, a histogram is, is a simple count, but you could do something like average or uh, probability distribution function are all these different things. Also, you can choose the bins to be spatial um, or combinations of variables, so more like a scatter plot. Um, there, everything you can do in Visit, um, you can do through a Python interface, um, including writing complicated new pieces of code in Python. Um, I personally never use this. I just write operators directly in Visit in C, but um, there, there are people who, who do this a lot. Um, there are um, there is support for scripting in R in Visit, um, which uh, is is a, a challenge because uh, you know not a lot of people are using R in parallel. So there have been a couple of different efforts in in DOE to do sort of parallel wrappers for R. Um, those have been integrated into Visit. Um, there's a cartographic projection operator, so if, if any of you have ever written the code to uh, convert from one mapping to another for climate data, you know it is a giant pain in the ass. Um, and so even though there are a bunch of different projections, um, I can also promise that if you really need one, it's probably not going to be one of those, because that's the way things work. Um, so you're still going to have to do that difficult work. Um, 
There are new hooks for dealing with missing data. Um, and this is something else that if you've ever had to deal with missing data, it's also a giant pain. Um, so in things like our spreadsheet plots, you can, you can tag things as missing values and then so it's handled appropriately in the final visualizations. There's an in situ library, it's called LibSim. So if you, um, if you have a simulation running and you want to look at results as it's running, you can instrument LibSim in your simulation. Um, it seems a little difficult to do. Um, you have actually have to make your simulation. Uh, uh, you implement enough to have the simulation tell visit that it is actually a visit engine. So that when you <coughs> run visit and you connect directly to the simulation. So on the one hand, it's kind of like, oh crap, I have to make, uh, <coughs> I have to implement an entire engine in here. On the other, you get literally all the functionality of visit um, from your simulation as well while it's running live. Um, and then, like I said, there are a bunch of supported file types. So if your data it happens to be one of these um, 120 or so, then you're good to go. Um, I, I just like to um, present these in, in two ways. One is this giant dump, and then I have this little slideshow of the different um, application code formats. Okay, so um, I, I like at this point to say that, uh, you know, I, I feel like, like I, I've kind of said, okay, great, you know, th there, there are these tools that even on supercomputers can do everything you want. Um, if you come to me and you say, I, I really need this piece of functionality, if it's not there, um, I'll add it, right? Um, however, uh, oh, and I've also said, okay, great, there are all these formats, so you should be good to go. Um, it turns out that uh, the vast majority of the time, um, the first thing we have to do is still sit down and, and write uh, custom code to integrate simulations into Visit, even with all those. So those are just the ones where Visit developers have sat down and done this work and then added it to Visit proper. We still have to do this all the time. Um, so uh, there, <laughs> these are my favorite examples for um, when we've had to do this in the past. So there, um, CM1 code running on Blue Waters um, had an IO bottleneck. And so the scientist running this, uh, using uh, HDF5, implemented his own buffering. So that this is a case where the every time step, not a ton of data is being generated. So you could actually buffer these time steps together, dump them out all at once, and then you get this great speed up of 30 or 40 times. Of course, as soon as he did this, um, the data that was left on disk was completely unrecognizable. Um, so the very first thing we had to do was write a a, uh, a separate data reader for this one scientist who had done this clever thing with his IO to, to even re-enable the visualization he was already doing. Um, and so this image and the one from before are visualizations using that custom data reader. Um, we had another scientist who um, <coughs> was writing uh, astrophysics code, uh, looking at the just uh, undersurface of the sun, um, and he was writing out just these giant binary files. So they're multi-terabyte, multiple time steps, multiple variables, all in one giant binary file dumped out. There is support um, in visit for binary files, but only single variable, single time steps. And so I wrote this other reader called the range of block files, the .rob, um, that would allow for any of these uh, variables, time steps, and then to have these dimensions ordered in different ways as well through, through files. Um, and this image at the top, um, yeah, it, it's a totally worth, worthless image, but this is actually um, 10,000 streamlines seated at the surface of the sun, and then, um, oh, excuse me, a million streamlines seated at the surface of the sun, and then this was generated on 10,000 cores on blue waters as a uh, test. So this is, uh, in particular, the, the biggest single uh, frame of, a, of uh, visualization I've ever created. Um, <laughs> so this was a, um, a turbulence code, and as you can see by my coloring, when I generated that image, I thought it was an astrophysics code, which <laughs> is embarrassing. Um, but uh, this is another one where um, the data was being written out, and in, in all I was told was um, uh, binary, unstructured, Fortran writes. 
And so when I um, when I went and dug up the uh, the API reference for Fortran there, it said, okay, you can expect either a header for every write telling you how big the write is, or one at the beginning and the end of every write. And I had no idea which. And so this was a lot of fun because the uh, the data was written out in pencils. So this was an 8K data set. It was written out in size. Um, 1K by 4 by 1, I think, was the resolution. So 64,000 files on this. Um, each one uh, was uh, had the full scale of, of the X, uh, of the XYZ, of the X component. And so he gave me this small test data set to look at, and uh, I, I read in the first one, and it turns out that the um, I was expecting one or two values based on whether the I had a byte at the front or one at both ends. And this is the only time I've ever had this happen where the data he gave me was written at a different Indian nest than Blue Waters. And usually you read in the first value, it's trash. In this case, um, the, the uh, big Indian version of the number I was expecting was the other number I was expecting. It took me <laughs> forever to figure this out. This was awful. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, but so this guy is also the... Um, the first volume rendering of their AK data set that they've ever seen. Okay, so then the next one, um, this was an image that um, ended up in Nature <coughs> from a science team who was looking at, um, this is a quarter, so if you, if you um, uh, rotate this around then you'll see the sort of the full star, so this is um, symmetric data. They use this code that is completely incompatible with visit. Um, so the reader they had would not work in parallel. And we had this request saying, okay, we need this new image for uh, nature. We need it by tomorrow. So this is a case where we didn't have time to write this, uh, this custom code. And we, we came up with this like 11 step process of reading this little bits in, in, in serial and, and um, changing the formats and all this other nonsense. It took forever again just to generate a single image. Um, and then later, this same code was the one used when the gravitational waves um, were detected last year or the year before. Um, and we got the same sort of urgent request, except we had a month this time. Uh, okay, now you need to generate, instead of a single frame, you need an entire video of, of binary neutron stars. Um, and so that time I did rewrite the entire reader that was already there. Um, because of the way their, their simulation code worked, they had this really clever uh, uh, way of making their simulation writes fast, but each file, and again, we were at 64,000 on disk in this case, each file was not um, fully descriptive of all their all overall data set. So for them to read it back in, they were ha having to open every file on every core to figure out for every core what the metadata is across that, that data set. And so that was destroying visit, just trying to run, I mean, that was destroying anything, trying to run in parallel on blue waters. Um, and it also, in serial, um, resulted in a two hour overhead before you could even start looking at things, of trying to generate that, that metadata. So the new reader, I stripped out all their clever stuff and, and um, basically made a straight decomposition and, and cut that two hour runtime down to about eight seconds um, in serial. And you could also get it in parallel for, for um, finally. So this is a frame from the video that, that we made for um, the binary neutron stars. So this was a um, pretty recent work, I guess uh, beginning of last year. Okay, so, um, so I'll switch gears a little and talk about uh, utilizing non-simulation data. And so uh, everything I've shown so far is this sort of structured spatial 3D data. This is sort of the bread and butter for visualization in terms of um, the scientists that we work with. Um, however, um, so this, the structured data, um, you need a supercomputer to generate it. And uh, the question of, you know, do you use MapReduce on this kind of data? The answer is, yeah, of course. Uh, but except for the reduce, right? You, you don't. Uh, nobody wants any kind of reduction on this data set. So when people, when scientists, so sorry, I don't think that's clear. That was a joke. You don't use macro this kind of data. Um, so from the scientist that's creating the data, saying, okay, look, it, it needs to be this value. Uh, uh, it needs to be this size, and the whole thing is, is valuable. Can you please do that? 
And then from our perspective, um, they're basically telling us that the, the, the entire haystack is made of needles, right? And so what the hell do we do with that? Who knows? Um, and, but then you have the big data, right? And so I put big data in quotes. It's the, the hype big data, the thing that everyone wants to be involved in. Um, and so we think of this as non-spatially structured data, usually flying into some database. And while it's related, um, it's not you know, completely related. And so this is a case where, yes, people are using MapReduce or Spark or things like that on this kind of data. Um, and so back to the uh, water cooler definitions, we have uh, now, now you have data that's really um, a lot of it's industry focused. And so, you know, now you have instead of a scientist talking about what's special about this data, you have CES talking about what's special about this data. However, um, reduction is sort of implicit in everything you do with this. And so you have to really work with this kind of data to make it feel as small as any data that's ever being used. Um, and then, of course, so the, the alternate here is there are a bunch of needles here. Find as many as you can in a short amount of time. So uh, again, we, in addition to expecting reduction, we're also expecting to have to do these things quickly. Um, and so I guess the question is, if everyone's generating uh, scientist type data, then why do we care about it? And of course, we care because everyone else does, right? Um, and then, you know, begrudgingly, I had to go and and, and last year, add deep learning to my big data cloud, um, which, of course, is, is a, a whole other kind of worms that, that, um, that we're now forced to deal with as well. And so it turns out that even um, for us, you know, the uh, Cybis folks, there's still opportunities to, to uh, d deal with this type of data. And um, the simple one is that when you're running an uh, uh, HPC resource, you're generating a ton of diagnostic data, and that's exactly this kind of data, uh, dumping all this stuff into a database. And so we had to generate these tools um, to look at, at various things to help support the HPC center itself, and not just the science being run on the resources. And um, for Blue Waters, we have, um, they have this extremely complicated um, architecture for for um, collecting data on blue water, storing it in a Lustre file system, transferring it over to a different machine that's behind all these barriers, so it's secure. And really, from my perspective, all I care about, of course, is this database. And so we have this um, just typical um, SQL database access to that data. And so the first time that we started dealing with this data, um, I had walked into an admin's office and he had something, uh, he had this drawn on his board. And so naturally I was like, yeah, what, what the hell is that thing? And he said, well, we're really wanting a way to look at all of the uh, jobs running on Blue Waters um, with reference to each other. And it seemed really easy, but it turns out that this is kind of a, an ugly uh, Tetris problem, right? So you can see even in this case, you have a job starting, it's stopping. Um, if you have another giant job starting, you already have this little yellow job here, where do you put it? Do you, do you stack it on top of the things you already have here, in which case your y-axis doesn't mean anything anymore? Or do you rearrange things on a per minute basis so that you can ensure that the y-axis is now the number of nodes on your machine? And so we decided to do that latter bit. Um, <laughs> and of course, at the, when I started this, I didn't have access to the um, uh, to that, that firewall data set. So I thought, oh, that's no problem. I'll write a little code to generate some test data. And naturally, you have to write a scheduler um, to generate test data in this case. Uh, and this is when I learned, I was just dealing with processing. This is when I learned that if you have an infinite loop in your code on processing and you have it saved before you run it, um, once you kill it, it destroys all the code you wrote. So I wrote two schedulers that night. <laughs> and Half my slides are dead. Uh oh. Oh, they're back. Um, so this was the uh, prototype that I wrote on um, my my test data. So you can see that now if I have giant jobs, um, they're ending. I, I just sort of bend them around. So this this uh, empty space between every minute. Um, and then of course I got real data, and I started seeing things like this. So. This was the first image I looked at with real data, and I realized, great, there are all these giant jobs. They're running and they're stopping within a minute. Um, and this happens all the time. So I had this broad idea to 
take anything that didn't finish within this window and move it to the top so I wouldn't have all this uh, crazy stuff. Um, and then of course I ended up with the image on the right because artificially moving things at the top was breaking, being able to use less than or equal to uh, break ties for, for uh, size sorting. So these jobs that are the same size now, uh, every time I move something up, less than or equal is wrong for whether to put one all over the other. So I got these jobs crossing all over each other. Um, so this is the final system that we ended up with. Uh, this shows the, uh, the uh, representation of the 3D torus of blue waters as just the, uh, the locations of the uh, blades. So we, we think of the blades as X, Y, Z, and 3D torus, so that's just a 3D representation. And now we have color-coded the jobs running here, and they're the same as there. Um, so this, this window at the top is a one-hour window. This is a 24-hour window looking at the utilization of the machine. And if you click anywhere in the, um, in the ribbon view, then uh, this shows you what the layout of that job is on the 3D Taurus and gives you all the information about the job, who ran it, what sizes, and um, what the exit status was, things like that. Um, this was a case where, um, so after I wrote that little tool, the, um, the advanced user services for Blue Waters actually keep it running, and they use it to help monitor the system. And this was a case that they saw this in the course of um, just uh, monitoring the machine, and this looks like an issue, and it turns out that this user had put a thousand jobs in the um, Blue Waters queue, um, but accidentally had all of them riding out to his home area instead of to the scratch area. And so after running the first, um, after running, I guess, this guy, um, he had filled up his home area, and then every job running subsequently was saying, you're out of disk space, and it was just done. Um, and this was actually caught before his entire, um, before his entire thousand job cycle through our queue. Um, <laughs> So the um, early prototype of the system, I like to include this because I thought it was kind of fun. They asked me to write a fake one for this, um, uh, like a, a little video of this thing running for the, um, the ceremony that um, it was like the, the christening ceremony for Blue Waters. And so there are the, it, we're in this auditorium and there are these uh, famous people. So this is, this is Koshal, the uh, one of the uh, um, molecular guys. And he's standing in front of this tool, and he was, they, were, they were kind of doing this thing, like, oh, now I'm going to start a job on my phone. And he did a button, and they played this video behind him. And um, everyone, <laughs> the people who set up the ceremony, they thought for sure everyone was going to believe this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and every time one of these scientists did this, everyone started laughing. But <laughs> I was sitting right in front of one of the admins for Blue Waters, and they actually used this view. So uh, the only people that it fooled were the actual admins of the machine, because <laughs> They're like, yeah, right. And then this thing pops up, and they're like, wait, wait a minute. So I heard the guy rustling behind me. He's whipping out his laptop <laughs> to see if this, this, these jobs were actually running on the machine. So I thought that was fun. Um, this is more about Klaus. So um, this is a nature cover from work that was done on Blue Waters. Um, Klaus uh, passed away um, around a year ago. And so this is uh, sort of the, the, the major work that his group had done on, on Blue Waters. Okay, um, so now this, uh, I'll change gears again um, and just go through a few um, research projects. I think it's important for this groups to make sure that they have sort of um, various research so that they can broaden the, uh, the appeal they have to potential collaborators. Um, and so um, one of the recent things that we did um, to look at how we could utilize deep learning on um, blue waters data. Um, we, we have people at, at NCSA, and I'm sure everywhere, constantly looking for ways to use deep learning. Um, and it seems like, like uh, with all of our diagnostic data, this is a perfect fit. But of course, uh, for machine learning, you to train a machine learning model, you have to know a bunch of answers first, right? You have to be able to ask a specific question, have the answer to that question for the training, so that you can train this model, and then on new data you can ask that same question as before. And I think that's something that that uh, people tend not to think about when it comes to training machine learning models. Um, and so, 
what we did was look through our sort of available data and realize that, okay, well, um, I.O. is perfect in this case because we already know the answer for measured I.O. data, right? If we look at throughput, then we know um, the higher the throughput, the better the answer. So we can sort of use throughput directly as, as sort of the answer for training sets. Um, and so we used a, a couple of uh, machine learning models. Um, we used a deep neural net as well as a um, uh, support vector regressor. Um, <coughs> of course, the, the deep learning, we, we forced people um, for no reason other than this um, to use it. Um, and so we ran this on um, our first uh, training of the model. Um, this, this was after we had trained our first, first model. Um, this was the, the first time we were testing the model. So this is the throughput we expected on various configurations of I.O. And on our first test, so this is the deep neural net and the uh, support vector repressor. And this, these images on the right are errors. Um, on our first test, we, we expected um, to get terrible results for the lower values um, here. We didn't use any configurations like this in the testing, um, or very few configurations. And so we saw that, you know, generally speaking, um, wherever there was a peak in, in the underlying graph, there was uh, kind of a peak in, in, the, uh, in the, the model. Um, however, in this case where we didn't do a lot of testing, um, the peaks are opposites, um, whereas Back for the deep neural net, the peaks are in the right place um, throughout the entire distribution here. And then after we really, uh, so then we, we trained the crap out of it with all of our available data. And um, so that left us with um, a model to test where, yes? What are you modeling here? What insights were you hoping to get? Oops, what happened there? Um, Does IO stand for IO reads or? So, uh, yes, uh, we were modeling the throughput based on I.O. configurations. So, say you, you have a simulation that's uh, running on a thousand cores. You can have every core of the simulation writing at, at once, or you could, you could um, aggregate to one core and write once, or you could aggregate to the node level. And it turns out there are just thousands of configurations for how you can change one size of I.O. And so this is based on, I'm sorry, I should have explained that. This is based on various configurations for writing the same size of data on blue waters. What the expected, what in this case, what the actual throughput is for those configurations. So you can see that basically all these configurations are terrible. Um, and this one's great, and that one's pretty good. Right. Um, so uh, these are the results for the um, for the, the final testing. Um, you can see that our errors are much tighter around zero in both cases. Um, and again, the deep neural net is much better at, at peaking in the right place um, than, than the um, SVR. Now, we didn't know what we were doing really with this. And so it turns out that our scales were completely different. You can see that I have the scale from zero to one. So I, I've rescaled both the underlying distribution and the, the model distribution. So um, we realized that from this work, we didn't have an opportunity to, for someone to say, okay, if we give you a configuration, tell us um, what, what the expected throughput is. We can't do that with this, with this model. However, what we can do is we can say, given two configurations, we expect this one to be 10% better than, than the other one. Um, and so with that, we actually wrote a little utility um, that would take that model and look at the brute force configuration space and, and tell you what the, the highest throughput or what the most efficient I.O. configurations were. And interestingly, um, for this um, test that we did on the utility, we used the configuration setup for an actual simulation that's running on blue waters. Um, and that simulation has these terrible, teeny tiny little writes. Um, and, and they do it, um, we've seen them both use file process and one single shared file. And um, the utility actually recommended uh, a very complex aggregator where it wanted each node to write to eight separate files, but it wanted every file to only be written by four nodes. And so it's splitting things out in a way that actually utilizes an interesting trick 
um, which is to ensure that, that every node is riding in different directions on the, on the torus. Um, and this increases your injection bandwidth. So I was actually really impressed that this model would, would find you um, a, a very complex and, and um, interesting IO configuration. Um, so this is a separate project, uh, visual representations of complex features. Um, model fit is, is the technique. This is actually an operator in visit now. Uh, but this is like a, an analog to uh, clustering data so that if you have a lot of complex interactions among variables, you can cluster them and you can look at them in the same context. So um, one way to think of this is um, scales are really uh, difficult to deal with in this case, right? So if you have, say, pressure and, and something else, then you have to make sure scales are appropriate to make comparisons. And so this is the result of looking at a comparison of something like pressure and then um, latitude, or whichever one banded that way, I, I can never remember. Um, and so in this case, the scales make no sense. So if you try to compare them and say which one is more interesting than just the latitude or longitude, whichever is the only thing that shows up. Um, and so that you, know, you could think of the value of these comparisons to be this distribution, whereas if you convert things to sort of a probability density space, then you can see both the latitude banding as well as whatever the values for that, that scalar variable are and the distribution gets spread out. So basically you can think of, this is a tool to look at combinations of variables and flatten distribution so it's easier to make selections. And so this is a case where um, we were trying to show in a single image sort of a path of a hurricane. So this is a Hurricane Isabel data set um, where we just checked like Wikipedia and saw that as the eye of a hurricane passes over, then the uh, temperature is reduced. And so we made this ridiculous request. It was like, show us everywhere that on one time step, temperature is at a maximum, and the next time step, it's at a minimum. That doesn't happen anywhere. But the places where it happens most are, is still this area. It sort of gives you that, that notion. Um, wrong way. And then this one over here is um, looking at, we, we specify climate eco regimes, uh, 30 of them or so, um, in that interface, and then we can see where those where those uh, 30 separate eco regimes are, even though that's not a variable in the underlying data set. Um, all right, I'm running out of time. This was something for uh, feature detection. Uh, we looked at what would happen if you clustered by using nothing but a histogram, terrible. We looked at what would happen if you did nothing but location-based clustering. Still terrible. Um, but then we created a weighting function between the two. And, and after doing that, this is the result of trying to pick out what we thought was the interesting things. And this is with no, no further definitions of what's in interesting. Um, this is a simple toy data set where we knew what was interesting. And so we captured about 90% of, 96% uh, of, of what was in the uh, interesting bits of the data. Um, so I mentioned before that um, streamlines or particle advection algorithms are very complicated, right? So this is an example of why. They tend to look um, in, uh, like any of these. And so if you have a uh, particle that is, in this case, is the, sort of the worst case, it's spinning around this thing. Um, every time it leaves a spatial domain, there's a communication that needs to happen. But if you say, okay, fine, then I'm always going to parallelize over, uh, over particle so that I keep them, um, then something like this happens where they, um, they never leave and you're still, you're still broken. So this one's an easy way to make sure that things are never work, um, never optimal. And even though for every case there is an optimal solution, but you have to solve the problem and figure out what it is. So that's not very helpful. So we did this. Um, um, Parameter suite, 19,000 tests on a supercomputer at Oak Ridge, and found that, uh, first of all, using runtime uh, didn't work as a metric for looking at load imbalance. So everything had a low runtime compared to the other things. So we developed a new metric that we called imbalance directly, which showed what more of what we expected, which was uh, instead of everything is great, everything is terrible, which is, is we knew that to be the case. Um, and the interesting thing about here was that um, 
Of the 19,000 configurations we tested, the default configurations for running on these data sets was almost always the worst. And so what everyone does when they do this is they open the code, they say, okay, show me the default, and then they start tuning. And so we're, we're seeing that for nothing other than having these default values is what they were, we're, we're literally wasting uh, computational resources by just showing them before we start tuning. <laughs> I just like to, <laughs> so we, we wrote a paper about this and we titled it Tune to Terrible. And this is the graphic that my co-author created for, um, for that paper and, and he showed it at the talk that he gave about the paper and nobody laughed. And so <laughs> it's one of my favorite things ever now. <laughs> okay, sorry, moving on. Um, so now we also want to enhance the diagnostic data that we had before, so now this is research in that space. Um, Basic idea is when we're looking at these SQL tables, that a table is not a good enough data model. What happens if you apply a scientific visualization data model to that type of data? Um, so we wrote this thing. Um, now this is an HTML code. And this is the, uh, the important bit. So um, we, we implemented a data model that just lets you say, okay, great, we have data. We're going to set a value at an index. We're going to call it the variables. And then once you do this, then, um, then you can generate these um, uh, separate plots. You can utilize this. We have statistics and everything built into that data model. So this is one we created for um, uh, NBA box score data, where we have uh, these linear regression lines. And these are correlations um, that are all sort of taken care of. In the, the data model. Um, dashboarding is also um, automatic in these cases. So this is a little uh, manager that we wrote where you click anywhere in this window and you drag and you let go and it draws the plot. That's how you, oh, we know how to do these plots. Which ones do you want? So you can specify any of these things and then if you make a selection and this plot is automatic, it, it, will, it will carry through all the rest of those plots. And then we use the same tool to look at the load balance directly for the back to the parallel particle regression. So this is a case where we had eight cores and we were looking at um, which of those eight cores was doing work, which one had a bunch of uh, particles to communicate to its neighbor, and so on. Um, <laughs> we also like to get a little weird sometimes with research. Uh, so this is one where um, we were looking at, uh, so the, the other people in my group will have, I have one guy with, a, with an MFA um, and another one who was his student forever. And so they're really hard on people who use rainbow color maps and I was one of them when I got to NCSA. So they made me feel terrible. And, and, and the, the color map shaming crowd likes to do something like this, take the Mona Lisa and say, look, look what happens, look what you do, look how you ruin life if you put a uh, rainbow on it. And so I found these images, it was, Dear NASA, please no more color, rainbow color scales, or <laughs> rainbows kill people. <laughs> so this is the motivation for this work. Um, uh, basically, we, we tried to wrap 100 years of color theory into a code that would, that would automatically correct um, a color map without getting rid of all the colors. So you see a lot of work like this, where people say, oh, this color map is perceptually perfect, but right, it's ugly, kind of, right? It's, it's, I mean, look, she looks great, but, but you have like three muted colors here. Um, and so the, the purpose of this work was really to see how much we could correct, but still kind of keep a rainbow. Um, and then correct a little more, but uh, still have a semblance of a rainbow, and then correct the hell out of it and, and see what happens. So uh, perceptually, there, there are levels of how perfect they are, but at the same time, they're in, inversely proportional to the, uh, the rainbow-ness of each one of these color maps. Um, and then finally, do I, do I need to stop or can I, can I go four more minutes? I'll let you go. Okay. Um, so <laughs> these are the um, eye candy images, so they're, they're faster. So the, uh, the other point is that, of course, you want to have um, very uh, outreach as well as very uh, research. Both of these are very important in terms of uh, bringing in scientists. So, so these are some of the early works for uh, posters that the Blue Waters Project made or, or um, newsletters, things like that. Um, we've done a few uh, uh, show, uh, SC showcases. Um, this was um, my first one. 
maybe 2012 or something, so it's a while back. Um, and then newer ones for different um, different scientific domains. Um, this um, one of the guys in, in my group is is an expert on graphics. He wrote the volume renderer that did this, um, and, and it is as good or better than anything on the market. Um, and <laughs> so this is actually the same scientist as this. This is what my image looks like. <laughs> That's what his look like. And um, when we sent the first test image to this guy, um, it was this, and this is what he told us. <laughs> um, and I included that in my quarterly report to NSF. Um, <laughs> um, and then this is the same guy uh, doing white, white door collisions. These are more recent. Um, I said exceed, it may be perk now, I don't, I don't remember. Um, this is someone else in my group uh, who did this, this uh, beautiful rendering of, of two black holes. Um, the interesting thing about this one was um, he took a slice through there um, and he rotated the slice as the, the things were rotating around each other. And so those black dots stayed in the same place. But this, this stuff changed a lot um, as they were rotating. And it turned out to be um, kind of a simple thing. None of the tools that we had had direct support for this. He went back to BTK and wrote 10 lines to do to rotate this slice plane. And then all of a sudden, we have a new representation. The scientist said, oh, I've never seen sort of uh, this part of the data. So, even though we had both of these in the same conference, it was interesting. I mean, because this one is just stunning. It's unbelievable. Um, but this one sort of resonated most with people um, because of that, that sort of simple thing that you could do to, to uh, increase your understanding. Um, these were the more recent ones. So this was the newer thing with uh, streamlines, um, the, the tropical cyclone ocean interactions. This is, again, the same renderer that the guy wrote. Um, this was kind of an interesting one because, again, he just sort of tilted this uh, to have this sort of isometric view, and then all of a sudden you can see uh, sort of these these mixings um, and and this this warm pool that goes across the equator. This is something else they hadn't seen before. <laughs> um, and then we did this thing. It was it was god awful. Um, the uh, director of NCSA asked me uh, particular. Uh, it just, he made me do this for SC one year. We had this, this uh, terrible collaboration where um, at Argonne National Lab, they, they ran this giant simulation. They shipped all the data over to NCSA for post-processing. We did the post-processing. We sent it over to um, the showroom floor on this um, big data server that we had provided by DDN. And then we wanted to show how using Cynet uh, uh, on the showroom floor, we could do uh, live visualizations and display them on. This is the electronic visualization lab from University of um, from uh, UI Chicago, and um, the I had recruited someone else to do the visualization, so I wouldn't have to. And he, he fell off the face of the earth before I see. So I ended up stuck in this chair for about um, 18 hours a day uh, for the first three days of SD, and I finally got this image on um, on EVL screen. And this is the uh, scientist who generated the data standing in front of it. Uh, at from she's from Argo. All right, and then finally, um, we did some um, some pretty extensive training. Um, so I mentioned that we wrote a, a special reader for that that climate guy. Uh, he took that reader and ran with it. So this is sort of a great success story. This is the SC video he did without us. He he muscled us out. Um, uh, so we he didn't need us anymore. That's awesome. Um, and then for the uh, scientists who generated this data. Uh, he actually came and sat down next to me for three days at NCSA and learned everything about this. Um, and while he was there, uh, I implemented things in his reader that would do things like um, uh, stagger the grids for half of these variables, and so they were all just right going in there. And, and like I said, I never saw that guy again. <laughs> I had no idea if he's doing okay. <laughs> all right, that's it. So there's slide 100. I'm happy to take any questions or I'll, I'll be here for a while. Yes? Given a lot of examples where the data input generated what you made sound like useless results, like garbage in, garbage out, can I just take a simple spreadsheet, import data, and work on a visualization, or is that not practical? 
Um, well, so um, it depends on what you have in the spreadsheet. I, I would say that it, if, if the data that you have is already in a spreadsheet, it may not be the right type of data for this, for this tool. How much code writing is required on the input side before I can meaningfully use this? Well, um, so if your data is already in a spreadsheet and you have, say you have, um, uh, you can export as comma separated and you have an X and Y and Z as, as part of the columns in your spreadsheet and a variable as a, a next column, uh, Visit will already do, work with that. There's a, a format where you can already do that. And it's a pretty common one that, that we get a lot. So anytime that um, the vast majority of the data are they're binary or they're, they're compressed or something, but if we have that or text data, then yeah, there's a, a plain plain text reader that, that will work with that. You can go in there and tell that it's comma separated. You can tell it the first row is going to be the name of the variables and uh, the first three or two are going to be the, the spatial variables. You can do that, sure. And I, I think that there may be some other tools that, that um, and I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce, but Richard Johansson, who's, do you want to stand up, Richard? He's a library and he's their data visualization specialist who can probably help you if you wanted to make it a time. Uh, am I, I'm not speaking out of turn, am I, Richard? Richard's the right, he, yeah, he would be the right person to go to first. Yeah, for that, start there, yeah. and then he'll, he can help you maybe with some other, you know, R studio yeah. or something like that to do some visualizations. Yeah, that sounds like it'd be perfect for R um, mm -hmm. or, or Tableau or... Yeah, so. Uh, yes? I'm looking at a multiple simulation for the widgets, and I'm interested in the droplet statistics, like a uh, starter millimeter. The problem is we're only capturing the viewer, so our interface capture is happening based on it's between either zero or one. So where zero is cat, it's one is just different. So how do we go about winning those right? And it's working on the AMR as well. So you you have labels. Uh labels as uh, So you're, you're saying that your your data set is just a, a uh, zero or one or for a liquid jet? I maybe we'll have to look at that and in, in a bit. I'll, I'll see if the other questions are easier. <laughs> yes? Um, you mentioned that VISIT might not be the best for molecular dynamic simulation. What would be better options? Um, so VMD is, is excellent. Um, and if you have to go beyond, um, if you need to run in, in, in big parallel, there are research codes for DOE that are, that are, that are pretty good, but you have to um, contact those developers first. But I would try VMD first. Yeah. Yes. Why did you call that visualization? Why did you call it representation of your data center a torus? So that is the um, the uh, the torus is a donut, right? Like three dimensional. Yes. Rate. So right, three D torus is a four D object, right? But um, this is the way the the machine is is wired together. So on the floor we have say row row uh, zero, and then next to it is row twenty three, and then next to that's row one. And so they're actually wired together so that four zero, um, the node twenty three and the nodes one are the closest to. So it, it's wired like a like a donut, but it's it, it's a three D torus. If you were to take a, a bunch of points on that torus and connect them by a string and throw it out the window, right? It, it, that's the way it's wired. Okay. So it's the the network topology. Yeah, because what you showed the, the grid of nodes you showed looked like a cube. <laughs> yes, um, I am not a fan of that grid of nodes. I um, because it, like, like you said, if you're sitting at, in in the middle of that, the distance is really um, the distance is not a, a linear function of, of, of that grid of nodes. Everyone is convinced they can understand that. I, I can't, so um, I'm yeah, I'm kind of with you on that. All right, is there anything else? Well, I guess if there, are, there aren't any other questions that you want to ask as a group, feel free to approach Rob during the lunch. We're going to have lunch now from...